Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, lecture series, and this will be on uh, CT evaluation of pancreatic cancer, current concepts in detection and staging. And I realized I hadn't given a talk on pancreatic cancer in a while, and there's so much new, so much changing, I thought I would try to put things together. If you look at some of the numbers, pancreatic cancer is the 12th most common cancer in the U.S. However, when you look at the number of deaths, it's much higher. Uh, also, it seems to be as other tumors find cures or survivals increase, pancreatic cancer really hasn't changed. 53,000 plus cases of pancreatic cancer in 2015 and 41,000 deaths. That's like 80%. And remember, we talk about the fact that although death rates for most cancers have declined, uh, pancreatic cancer is really flat to slightly increased due to an aging demographic. Survival, at best, you can say 8%, and surely under 8% is going to be the magic numbers. Patients are living longer. You remember when we typically would do pancreatic cancer, we'd say survival is six months. Now people do live a good life for like three years, two to three years, but of course, that's not making five-year survival. And you can see over time, this is from uh, well over 30 years, just the um, numbers, the survival and the new cases seems to be on the rise. And survival is just terrible. Now, we know a lot about pancreatic cancer. There's some environmental exposures, tobacco, carcinogens, new onset diabetes. We're not sure if the new onset diabetes is leading to pancreatic cancer or is just a sign of early pancreatic cancer. My guess would be it just means the pancreas is beginning to fail and it's a sign, and I think that's something that's being evaluated now. There's some work from the Mayo Clinic, and there's going to be a multi-center trial on this as well. Now, we do know that there is a family history for pancreatic cancer. Up to 15% of all pancreatic cancers are considered familial, which is defined that at least two affected first-degree relatives. The lifetime risk for patients with three or more first-degree relatives is 40%. 10% for two and 6% for one, but that's still almost a 5% increase compared to the population. I did a walk for the Lust Garden Foundation a couple of weeks ago, and there were a number of people whose parents or sister or brother had died of pancreatic cancer. And when they would speak to you, you would they would tell you how many family members they had die and that they knew they were walking time bombs. There's work going on at Hopkins, other institutions for screening, a pancreatic cancer doing EUS or CT or MR, but that screening part, even in high-risk populations, has never been all that successful. This article from Hopkins making the point that we are making some progress, we're learning a lot, genetic mapping, can we detect things earlier, perhaps detect very much like we detect polyps and colon cancer, but the work is progressing, but it's not where it needs to be. Now, in terms of how we manage patients, at the end of the day, the goal, of course, is for early detection and then doing chemo and surgery. Um, how we define pancreatic cancer in this article, a tumor is potentially resectable if it can be re technically removed with negative margins without compromising the vascular supply. Uh, when you have adjacent organ involvement, it really depends where. If you have a duodenum and a pancreatic head mass, that's not going to make you unresectable. If you have a tail lesion and a splenic involvement, that's not going to make you resectable. But the key thing is to get an R0 resection. If you're not going to have negative margins, there's no reason to operate. Now, surgeons, I know at Hopkins, we have incredible surgeons. They've gotten better. We can do things laparoscopically. Uh, we can do much better job at a resection with less complications. We talk about patients who are potentially unresectable because of celiac involvement and then get procedures like the Applebee procedure. So we are doing a lot better. And so we've changed a lot of patients from what was considered unresectable to borderline resectable. And you look at borderline resectable, it's things that were always considered unresectable, short segment involvement of the hepatic artery, abutment of the SMA, but under 180 degrees, short segment occlusion of the SMV or portal vein, where you can do grafting and the like. Now, we have tried to optimize and strategize on pancreatic cancer. We have a one-day clinic where patients come in the morning, they get a 3D CT, they get lab work, they get evaluated. 
we have a conference at 11 o'clock. We decide how we should manage those patients depending on what we decide. They'll meet with surgery, oncology, radiation therapy, maybe multiple people. Now we've learned that that's really efficient. Um, it changes often how the patients, 18.7% uh, of patients had to change their status based on this. And it's not just the Hopkins thing. Here's another article I think is from Sloan Kettering. Again, expert consensus uh, was, when you had experts reaching a consensus, it was significant change in management. And in this article, look at their things. The number of patients with a false positive pancreatic mass decreased from 45 to 11. Uh, patients who had what looked like a tumor, and we've seen the same thing. We diagnosed autoimmune pancreatitis in patients who were sent in for cancer. We diagnosed lymphoma. We diagnosed small bowel gist tumors, small bowel carcinoid tumors. So you really can change the process, and we know that Pancreatic cancer, both early diagnosis, lesions are missed, but when they're found, they're often misclassified. So there's a lot of work specialized centers can do. There's a lot of work all of us can do to get better at recognizing the lesions. Now, in this article by Alhari, trying to reach a consensus, this is from the Society of Abdominal Radiology, SAR, and the American Pancreatic Association. The goal was to try to reach templates for reporting uh, results so that you can compare different trials amongst different institutions. But once we started doing that, we recognized that you can't do a standard template for reporting unless you had uniform processes for acquiring the data. And again, thin section CT, 3D imaging was critical. CT angiography was critical. Unless you have these quality images, it was concluded you need to repeat the study because trying to create these dedicated reports without a dedicated protocol is not gonna work. And so this article is really good. If you're not following this, you better follow it. This is the CT scan protocol. The article is really good. It goes into arterial involvement, how you describe it. It goes into venous involvement, how you describe it and also the extra pancreatic disease, how you describe it. So, and you realize that in order to fill out these forms correctly, the protocol needs to be correct. If you're not doing dual phase CT, if you're not doing thin sections, if you're not doing post-processing, you just can't answer the questions. And so this appendix also goes through and describes many of the key features. Another article by Brooke made the point that structured reporting of pancreatic cancer really did help the surgeons. When surgeons reviewed reports in combination with multiphasic CT images, they were likely to convert an answer of unsure regarding resectability to a more defined yes or no. Articles from Hopkins make the point that the accuracy of CT is dependent on timing. And so we know if you have a scan that's two months old and it looks resectable, that's not good enough literally before you operate, you need a scan within a month. Because some patients progress rapidly and you would hate to go in on a scan that's two months old on an outside CT, and then find when you open the patient they're unresectable. So this is a very, very important article in that regard. Now in terms of protocols, we use water to distend the stomach, wait 15 to 20 minutes max, inject five cc's a second of about 100 to 120, typically around 100 cc's of contrast. We have two phases, arterial and venous, and that works very nicely. Arterial phase is great for picking up neuroendocrine tumors, not as good for picking up adenocarcinomas, but it's critical for looking at the mesenteric vessels, SMA, celiac, hepatic artery, and determining resectability. It's also critical for looking for small liver lesions because you could pick up perfusion changes. And then when you see a lesion on the venous phase, which you might say is indeterminant, if you see perfusion changes in an arterial phase, you know it's gonna be malignant. So we always do dual phase imaging. Things like median awkward ligament syndrome, stenosis of the celiac or SMA for atherosclerotic disease, all become important if the surgeon's gonna do a Whipple's and sacrifice the GDA. Unless you have good blood flow through the celiac, you can have a catastrophe. So again, it's very, very important. 
The venous phase, on the other hand, is probably best for picking up tumors, seeing the pancreatic duct, picking up small lesions. It's also the best for picking up liver metastasis in general because liver mets are typically hypovascular, but you need both phases. And we do 3D mapping from the arterial phase as well as the venous phase and really get a good look at the portal vein and SMV. Now with 3D, it's not from yesterday that we've come up with this idea. This is a long time ago, 1997. By adding 3D imaging of vessels, the negative predictive value of a resectable tumor was 96% compared to only 70% for axial images. And House from Hopkins at 4 and 16 slice showed the increased accuracy. CT with 3D was 95% accurate in determining involvement of the key mesenteric vessels. Now imagine how much better we can do with the current scanners. This is like a lifetime ago. Now when we look at pancreatic mass, we look at size, we look at enhancement changes, we look at the duct, common and pancreatic, as well as mass effect. We look at enhancement of the pancreas. We look for changes, either increased enhancement, as you might see with neuroendocrine tumors, or decreased enhancement, more classic for adenocarcinoma. Is something hypovascular? Is it hypervascular? So in this case, you can see a low-density lesion in the head of the pancreas, which is better appreciated on the coronal and the 3D views. You can see the fatty infiltration of the gland around this mass, and you can see that very, very nicely. The uh, patient's lesion and relationship to the portal vein and SMV is simply that it extends near, there's no vascular involvement, and so this patient would be resectable. We talk about a case like this, where now you see atrophy of the distal gland. There's a difference in enhancement between the body and the tail. When you look carefully, there's a low-density lesion present, and there's multiple cysts in the remaining gland. This is an adenocarcinoma that arose in an IPMN. But the enhancement, the mass effect, all of the things make it very simple to recognize the lesion. And in this case, this patient should do very well and should be resectable. Sometimes you see associated pancreatitis, and you need to be very careful. It's very easy to walk by the presence of a mass in the presence of pancreatitis. There's often a 5% overlap. But again, cystic lesions, think IPMN, they can be precursors. And here's the same case very nicely showing you the differential enhancement of the head of the pancreas and body, and then the differential and changes toward the tail of the pancreas, nicely seen on these um, 3D cinematic renderings as well. And we are putting a lot of effort looking at optimizing the detection. And when you think about AI, a lot of the stuff that it's doing in that black box is really looking at texture. And you can simply change the parameters to show you the arterial and venous structures so that you know this patient indeed would be resectable. Now, as I mentioned, most adenocarcinomas, best shown venous phase, as in this example, we see a hypodense mass in the body of the pancreas. Here's a few more images of that. You don't see much of a dilated pancreatic duct. In fact, the pancreatic duct is barely visualized. But here it is again, cinematic, looking at the textural change, thinking about how we can optimize that textural change for being able to see the pancreatic mass. And I'm showing you this to make you think about how you can optimize lesion detection. Now, I think in this case, whether it's the axial CTs or the 3Ds or the cinematic renderings, you should recognize the tumor in all cases, but in some cases, that's not going to be the case. Now, I mentioned we look at the pancreatic duct. Here's the pancreatic duct dilated. And then you can see in the body, there's a transition. There's a low-density zone present. And that's classic for a carcinoma. Or in this case, again, dilated pancreatic duct, abrupt cutoff. You see abrupt cutoff as cancer till proven otherwise. Here we see the mass. Sometimes you don't see the mass, but that's how you pick up isodense pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Look at that transition point. That is the critical finding. You also see on the venous phase imaging the lack of enhancement of the distal body and tail. So you see both the change in duct, you see the low density. There are a number of findings that allow you to make the diagnosis. Or in this example, there's a dilated pancreatic duct with abrupt cutoff. The harder you look on coronal, you see the mass present and you see it here as well. But if I only saw the duct, that would be enough. 
and this case can easily be missed. And many of the common misses we see or where there's duct dilatation and people don't recognize the lesion, maybe they didn't give enough IV contrast, maybe the timing's not great, but if you see the duct, you have to know that there's a mass present. There's nothing else that can possibly be. You have to think of it that way. And here's the ones you're gonna pick up. Dilated pancreatic duct, abrupt cutoff, you look hard. Maybe you see something on, on the arterial, but look at the venous coronal. You see the transition point, there's a subtle mass effect on the pancreatic duct, that's a tumor. Now, Dr. Cameron would go right to surgery and maybe that's the right thing to do. Other people might do EUS and biopsy, but you're gonna get a biopsy that's positive. Again, abrupt cutoff of the pancreatic duct, those are the tumors that can be resectable. Here it is with cinematic rendering. So again, many ways of looking at it. I mentioned this isodense, this article by um, Kim way back when spoke about the fact that these are about 5% of cases, that sometimes MR or PET can be helpful or EUS I'll mention. I don't think it's 5%, it's probably more like 1% to 2%. But again, those are the lesions you wanna pick up because those are more likely resectable. Kaza wrote an article that said 10%, but also made the point this interrupted pancreatic duct, this duct cutoff becomes very, very critical. And so when I look at the chart I gave you, we have to look very carefully, is the duct dilated? That indeed becomes very classic. And so here's another example, differential enhancement of the head and then the body and tail. You see the mass presence, you see the duct cutoff. You see it better when I do volume rendering. The mass really stands out nicely, but the vessels are not involved. The patient would be resectable. Here it is again. And then here it is very, very obvious on the cinematic. Now, one of the key things with cinematic, we're trying to use AI as a way of predicting what the optimal rendering with cinematic rendering would be because I could use different renderings and both show or hide tumors. Can I have the computer be super smart and always, as in this case, detect the tumor. And that's a challenge that makes some sense, and we'll see how it goes. But you can see very nicely, as I go through a number of 3D reconstructions of coronal plane, how nice it is to see the lesion. Or in this case, where there's a lesion in the tail and a well as a lesion in the body of the pancreas near neck. Both are hypovascular lesions now, it's rare to see two tumors, I will agree, but this patient had two adenocarcinomas that were spontaneous. That's exceedingly rare. Here it is with cinematic. And here's the patient's vascular map. So a key thing is tumor detection and then staging. Our surgeons love the vascular mapping for preoperative planning, whether it's anomalies of vessels, whether it's vessel encasement, whether or not they can do things laparoscopically, are all things we can provide. And again, look at the correlation, the low density lesion in the pancreas and the textural changes seen nicely in dilated pancreatic duct on the cinematic display. Now, we talk about adenocarcinoma arising from IPMNs. Here's a large lesion tail of pancreas, but look how the lesion has grown posteriorly. The celiac, hepatic, and splenic arteries are all encased. This patient's not resectable. This was an interesting case of a tumor that arose from an IPMN. When you look at the tail of the pancreas with calcifications, you could have thought about a serous cystic adenoma. When you looked at the vessels, you know that wasn't the case. And this was a cystic lesion, which the malignancy developed within it, and you could see it spread posteriorly. This patient would be unresectable. Now, we also talk about other signs. I spoke about pancreatic duct. Here's the common duct. Very nice cutoff of the common duct. You see the mass on the coronal view nicely in the head of the pancreas. We also talk about the dilated pancreatic duct and the dilated common duct, the so-called double duct sign. And here the tumor looks resectable potentially. Involvement of a duodenum would not make you unresectable, and you can see the duodenum very nicely in this image. So a really nice example. Unfortunately, you can see this patient already has liver metastasis, so the patient would not be resectable. Now we talk about the dilated pancreatic duct, and let me just add one more thing. When the duct is huge, as in this case, that's a main duct IPMN. That's 
tremendously associated with malignancy. At a minimum, you're going to see high-grade dysplasia. Usually, you're going to see an adenocarcinoma. These are the patients that typically will get a total pancreatectomy. But when you see a duct over a sonometer, that's a bad sign. And truthfully, over 7 millimeters, they're going to do EUS. But a duct like this is always, always the big word, but essentially always is going to be malignant. And you could see here some of the side branch IPMNs, but a mixed type, but a huge main duct lesion. And that patient had high-grade malignancy. And there's another one with high-grade dysplasia. It almost looks like a pseudocyst for a second until you realize it's the duct. And occasionally you can get confused by the duct if you're not thinking about it very carefully and you don't have perhaps enough experience. Here it is nicely on the axial, and here it is very nicely on the 3D imaging. Now I showed you some cinematic cases and cinematic, I think, is a way of combining really good lesion detection with really good vascular display. So let me tell you a little bit more about that, and let me speak a little bit more about vascular imaging. But how about this? Why don't we stop right there, and we'll come back, and I'll tell you a little bit more. See you in a few minutes. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.